Good evening, everyone from Trinity Pauling School. We are hoping that you are having a fantastic summer uh, wherever you might be in the world. Um, we are happy that you're joining us for another series, uh, another um, episode of our Pride Perspectives. And this has been our summer series uh, that we've been happy to bring you many different topics, uh, many different professionals uh, from Trinity Pauling, but also from around the college scene, as well as our uh, fantastic alumni. And uh, for those of you who joined us for many of these, we appreciate that. I, I think it's been fun for a lot of us to, uh, to bring you this different type of information in a different way. And uh, obviously, uh, this, this all wouldn't be possible uh, if it weren't for the, uh, the world in which we live right now. And uh, we also have uh, two more that are scheduled for the summer series. Uh, next week, we'll be doing a webinar on fostering an ethos of effort. And we will be uh, talking with a, a, a couple of our alumni uh, who have been a part of Trinity Pauling and are off in the, in the real world. Uh, and they will be joining uh, Headmaster Taylor and me uh, to talk about uh, the 50 years plus of our, uh, what we hold most true to us in our effort around campus and, and character building around campus and, uh, and as we move forward. So we're happy to do that. And then we'll also be adding another uh, series, another webinar after that one, a couple weeks before the start of school to talk about the reopening and uh, give you information on that. So again, we're happy that you're here uh, welcoming you to this series. Uh, you've seen Mr. Harf uh, on one of these or a couple of these, co-director of College Counseling. His partner in crime is Slade Mead, uh, also one of our co-directors of College Counseling. You've also had the privilege of uh, seeing Roberta Liedel before. Uh, she's the director of our Center for Learning Achievement and of course, uh, headmaster Bill Taylor. And we felt like uh, even a couple of weeks ago and, and probably over a month ago that this topic of an ever-changing world was something that was uh, important to us, uh, especially at a time when the world seems to be in a state of rapid change. Tonight, we wanted to focus more on Trinity Pauling's educational program um, and how it helps the school deliver its mission. And the mission, um, for those of you who haven't heard it, I, I wanted to let you know, uh, the mission of Trinity Pauling School is to educate and instill a value system that prepares young men to be a contributing member of society amidst challenges of an ever-changing world. So I can't even think of a better time uh, than to be talking about our mission statement, about who we are as a school, how we teach our educational program uh, in this time period. Um, and, you know, Bill, this is, <laughs> this is one of those moments as a headmaster. It's, it's a focal point for you since you began your tenure uh, five years ago. Um, actually, Scott, Bill, me, we all showed up five years ago. Um, and there's been a lot of change academically in this time. And I, I think in your, you know, from you, from your standpoint, you know, how is Trinity Pauling delivering um, on this component of its mission? Because it is such a crucial thing right now. Absolutely. Thank you, JP. And good evening, everybody. Thank you for spending some time with us again this week. Uh, and before I uh, answer that great question or get into it a little bit, uh, just a, uh, an asterisk on something that JP just mentioned about uh, the uh, Pride Perspectives two weeks from now. We will be talking about sort of the, the most updated information on reopening. But for you parents who are on the call tonight, uh, we will be sending out an update tomorrow that will be part two of the re reopening plan with more, even more detail. Um, and uh, so be on the alert for that uh, coming coming into your inbox uh, tomorrow. And Bill, um, Bill, before you keep going, I, I forgot to mention one of the most important aspects of a webinar is that we do have the Q&A. Um, and please, uh, we have the, whether it's a, it's a Q&A button on your screen, 
But at any point in time, please uh, send us a question. You might hear me ask it out loud to one of our uh, professionals here, or we might just answer it to you uh, privately uh, from, from one of us. So I just wanted to throw that out there. Please do not hesitate to ask a question throughout the evening. Thanks, Bill. Mm -hmm. Well, this uh, idea of preparing students, preparing young men for an ever-changing world is something that uh, you uh, undoubtedly, if you're, you're a, a parent who's been at Trinity Pauling for uh, e a year or longer, uh, you've heard me talk about it. You've heard me you know, read what I've written about it. Um, if you follow me on Twitter, you've seen what I've tweeted about it. It's, uh, you know, it's a... Uh, it's something that we have leaned into quite a bit. Uh, and just an interesting side note, um, you know, that mission statement that uh, JP Burlington just read uh, was a product of the 2010 long range strategic planning process. Um, and as many of you know that uh, 2010, I was not at Trinity Pauling. I had left Trinity Pauling in 2001 uh, and returned in 2015. But uh, so I, I had no idea of the new mission statement that was created until it was sent to me in the materials that the consultant who was trying to get me to um, ex uh, get interested in, in applying for this job. And, and I read it and I was really so pleased to see that it was included in the mission statement. Because really what the school had decided in 2010 is that they wanted to pursue both tradition and innovation. And I believe that's very forward thinking. And, and so many schools sort of look at tradition and innovation as being mutually exclusive one to the other. Uh, but they're not at all. Uh, it's important to honor traditions. It's important to uh, ensure that traditions in a learning program or a school's culture uh, transcend from year to year uh, and era to era if they are valuable traditions. Uh, not all traditions are valuable, but the valuable ones, the important ones, the edifying ones need to continue. Uh, but schools also need to be able to be flexible, to be nimble, to adapt to a ever-changing world. And, you know, beginning in the, in the 1990s, maybe even the 1980s, uh, you know, the, the educational world began to shift. And by the early 2000s, it was, it was changing rapidly as technology was changing rapidly. And what was emerging is more important, uh, or not more important, but, but as equally important and perhaps more valuable as to teaching young people things they need to know uh, would be the skill and the practice of teaching young people how to use that information in dynamic, creative ways, in ways that could lead to the creation of original content because information in and of itself, really beginning in the 90s, uh, was becoming ubiquitous and it was becoming cheap. And you didn't have to invest in the same type of um, time and commitment to uh, acquire as much information. There will always be things that everybody needs to know. Uh, but what was be emerging to be more valuable was what you could do with that information uh, and that type of shift that was brought on by, largely by technology, uh, really over time uh, has merged with something that Trinity Pauling has always valued, and that is a, a student-centered approach to learning. And, uh, and that, you know, educational jargon speak, it's, it's, it relates to competency-based education, that you're, you're really teaching to the individual student in ways that build individual competencies. Um, and so as our curriculum has evolved, it has evolved around both the, the importance of tradition and innovation, and, and to include 
ways that students can create individual content that relates to things that they are interested in, things, uh, aspects or experiences that they want to explore more. While we're also doing calculus and, and chemistry and literature and all that, so that hasn't changed, but we've added new avenues to, to build this competency-based education. Um, you know, another aspect of the tradition uh, that is, is emerging is, is extremely valuable in, in these COVID times, and that is this ethos of effort, the effort system that is celebrating its 50th anniversary at Trinity Palm. But, you know, the, the, this concept of effort was something that was, that was part of Dr. Gamage's, the school's founder, his, his educational found, uh, philosophy at the, at the outset of the school's creation, predated the, cre the creation of this school. Uh, and what, what was brought to the school in 1970 was a way to capture this in a more dynamic way. Well, what, what a focus on effort does, it not only uh, relates back to, the, to a, an area of emphasis on character-based education that has always been part of the school's culture and and philosophy. But what it also does is it helps build resiliency. And, and you know, effort leads to resiliency. And in today's world right now, and this is pre-COVID, during COVID, it will be after COVID, <laughs> resiliency skills and the ability of schools to build those resiliency assets in students uh, is extremely valuable. And, uh, and that has always been part of, of this, uh, this school's uh, ethos um, and, and underpinnings. Um, and lastly, I, I'd like to point to something that we began five years ago, uh, began in the work of a, of a committee focused on teaching and learning, uh, but it led to a, uh, a collection of objectives of five objectives that became part of what we call the portrait of a graduate. And this, this is a uh, process that really be, began by looking at what we wanted the end result of the Trinity Pauling education to be. Uh, what do we want a graduate? What skills do we want uh, a graduate to possess? In addition to being a good person and being a gentleman and all that. But what are some core competencies that we want to make sure that we are building in the lives and learning of our students. Uh, and these five areas would be uh, to ensure that, uh, that our graduates are creative and critical thinkers, uh, that they are ethical citizens of the world, that they are effective communicators, that they're thoughtful collaborators. And this one I think is the most important, at least in my mind, that they are self-aware. They know who they are, they know how they learn, uh, they know what their gifts and talents are, or at the very least, they know they have gifts and talents and that they're on a road of discovery to find them. And I think those five core competencies are essential skills uh, to navigate today's world, an ever-changing world. Uh, and they are reflective of, of this shift in, in educational paradigms to prepare students for this world. So Roberta, I'd like to sort of pivot over to you uh, because the Center for Learning Achievement is, you know, is the current language that, uh, that describes a program that began in 1975 uh, as the language retraining program. Uh, and, you know, it also has its origins uh, back then, 45 years ago, uh, around competency-based learning. Uh, and also, in, in a way, experiential learning. Uh, it, it, it was an active program. Uh, it was the first to incorporate computers into, into the educational world, uh, beginning in in the, I think the late 70s and, and 80s. Um, and uh, 
So I'd love for you to sort of talk about that and how that relates to where the school was traditionally, but how it how it's moving the students forward who are in this program and everybody is impacted by the program and preparing them for the future. Absolutely. Um, yes, we are the original competency based uh, uh, formula for Trinity Pauling. Um, and resiliency is really at the heart of, of what we, we cultivate there. Um, uh, in the 70s, I've been very fortunate. I've been the director for, I believe this is my sixth year, and I, I inherited a really um, solid foundational program. And much of that foundation is still in existence. We know it's research-based. We know that, that the methodology um, it gets us to where we need to go, which is, is basically um, meeting boys where they are and using a strength-based approach to get them to feel confident in certain areas, shoring up certain areas, and then to, for them to thrive in those areas, which really dovetails beautifully in where we're going at Trinity Pauling when we're looking at um, you know, them looking at tr tradition and innovation. Um, we uh, absolutely were one of the first people to uh, use technology in the classroom. In fact, uh, I was cleaning out some files and some, uh, a couple of closets today, and I found some spellers, some little spellers that there were little hand speller, and I had to start laughing at, you know, now we have phones and we, and it's all these things are obsolete and I don't really know what to do with them, but there's a piece of me that feels sad that that is now gone, that that thing that we found that worked so well and was such a tool for the kids is now, you know, it's, it's a paperweight. Um, the kids, what we are doing, uh, from that piece, when I inherited that beautiful program, um, we have constantly been looking at how it relates to today's boy and, and how we can help them feel a connection to us so that they actually will um, take the lead in their learning process. And we do shore up, we shore up their, their, their skill set, and there is some tedious curriculum in there, you know, that you can't, just like with algebra, you can't get away from some of those basics, um, you know, repetition. Uh, but we, we are um, masters at explaining to these mature boys why they need to shore up phonics, for example, which so many people assume is a very um, elementary uh, exercise but we explain what we're trying to do with that, what we're, we're trying to build a muscle so that we're not using that cognitive energy. At the same time, we're trying to decompress them with, uh, we know that stress uh, takes over the prefrontal cortex, shuts it down and uh, lights up the amygdala and gives that uh, anxiety. And we know with our executive skills programs, that's the piece that we have to incorporate into this new modern day, especially with COVID. Um, there's a lot of anxiety and stress. So things that um, executive skills that they're challenged with just ha added another layer. And we're, we're addressing that and we're trying to stay up to date on um, the best methodology to reach these boys and to help them get that competency so that they can um, pursue their passion, so that they can feel competent and master other areas. Um, I know right now I, we're even adding some other things to the curriculum and this is how we are constantly evolving. I think I drive my teachers crazy, but we realize that a listening component, a really strong listening component, especially with now working with Zoom and, and, and these webinars and stuff like that, we have to build that into the curriculum. It has to be directly taught. So that's something new that's going into our curriculum. We're writing, you know, we're coming up with exercises and creative ways for boys to engage in that piece, um, which is actually great for all of us. Uh, we're also looking at um, trying to figure out ways to connect to them early. So if they are remote for a while, building the connection is the number one thing in my programs. So we have to come up with some really creative ways that we can do that early on and um, be efficient so that the boys can exhale and they know that we're there for them. And then they start to try new things, so. Bill, can I, can I add on to something that Roberta's missed? But I've seen a big change with the Center for Learning Achievement uh, because I was here before Roberta took the reins. But since you've taken the reins, Roberta, I, I gotta give you kudos because 
your your program has now become much more uh, in sync with the college process and, and our office. And I see Scott agreeing, but it's really wonderful because your group of kids, um, you not only help them in the classroom, you're now helping them with the college process, whether it's building the portfolio. Uh, mm -hmm. Last year, I believe you had some winter projects with the kids to help them. Uh, you've been involved in selecting schools with the programs that would be good fits for these kids. Uh, you've also been a, an amazing, and, and I'm not just saying this because I like you as a professional, but you really are terrific at advocating for these kids when it comes to the accommodation requests for, for testing. So, you know, I think you may be a little modest, but I've seen an, ama an amazing shift with that center working with the college office and it, it's it's terrific and it's not just our kids that are in our signature programs um we're there for for all of our boys and i think that needs to be said um uh you know we 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 are passionate about what we do and no matter what where they are in their process in their learning process or they're they're getting ready for college we're there for them so um I think it's, it's so. I'll pay you later. <laughs> it's, it's also reflective of uh, of the school's student-centered approach. I mean, I think you know the Center for Learning Achievement recognizes that everybody learns in different ways, and and for us as faculty, we sort of need to figure out those a, a dynamic toolbox in order to reach the potential of. Of, of these faculty. And I, I think what, one thing for the teachers who are teaching in the Center for Learning Achievement, they're wonderful in their collegial uh, support of their colleagues who are, who are not in teaching in the program by yeah. giving, giving strategies and so forth. Because we can all as teachers benefit from these, these learning strategies. And I think that, that that is also a critical aspect of, uh, of how we are preparing our students for an ever-changing world. And, you know, a shout out to the faculty because they're the ones who are actually doing this. And if the world is ever-changing, teaching methodology is ever-changing. And that means that uh, the professional growth and development of the faculty must be ever-changing. And that the faculty are committed to being students and teachers. They know that they need to continue to to grow professionally, to, uh, to learn how to uh, keep up with things like project-based learning uh, and the role of technology in, in education uh, or different learning styles. And, you know, this is not just, you know, being prepared to walk into a classroom and give a lecture for, for 45 or 50 minutes. That's, that's not what our classes look like. They're, they're far, you know, they're dynamic, they're creative, creative they're adaptive. And, and the teachers are the ones who are delivering this, this content and they're able to do that because they are, they are growing professionally. And, uh, and uh, if you think about teaching young people how to be prepared for this ever-changing world, you're teaching them how to be creative, you're teaching them how to be adaptive, you're teaching them how to take intellectual risks, you're teaching them how to be vulnerable, you're teaching them how to synthesize information rather than just memorize it. And if you're teaching that, you need to be learning that yourself and, and modeling it that. So we're all sort of growing in this, in this process. And we saw that when we introduced the practicum uh, because we were introducing essentially a graduation requirement that, that was introduced to the faculty five years ago. But we were saying this is, you know, we, this, this is something that's going to be as, so valuable. We're going to make it a graduation requirement that everybody's going to have to uh, participate in an interdisciplinary winter project. Every student, um, if, if, well, I should say every middle school student, every ninth, 10th, 12th grader, and postgraduate. Um, and where they are going to, they'll have an opportunity to, to, sign up for a project that two teachers have put together because they think it will be interesting and compelling and captivating and students have the freedom to sign up based on their interest uh, and then they they learn how to create something that furthers their knowledge and their uh, 
their engagement with an area that they think is compelling, that they think maybe is a passion. Or students have the opportunity to create their own project and get faculty to, to work with them. Um, and then the juniors work on a junior collaborative projects and the seniors do their own senior independent projects. So, I, you know, Scott and Slade, you, you really work with the students, the juniors and seniors who are, are doing this because it, it, it has tremendous advantages and, and uh, uh, potential for the college process. Yeah. Uh, and here I would also hearken back to the role that self-awareness plays in this. Uh, but these students, the Trinity Pauling students, not only they're prepare, they're learning these skills how to, how to, you know, that are necessary in today's world, uh, but they are also distinguishing themselves in the college process. So I'd like for you two to sort of jump in here and talk about how you're interacting with the practicum and how you see that uh, as an area of growth for our students. Bill, actually, I'm going to let Scott talk about the practicum, but I think, because I, I know the, we have a very diverse audience here, but I think there's something that everybody should be very aware of. First off, nobody knew COVID was coming. That being said, the fact, Bill, that you took over the reins five years ago, completely coincidental to COVID, in a way, is a blessing for us because we had a headmaster, Arch did a great job, but he had been in there for 24 years, 25 years, and you get comfortable. And you came in five years ago and shook things up, which they had to be shaken up. But the beauty of the timing, and this is just complete luck, is the shakeup is now taking seed and is growing right when we hit COVID. And I would argue you could take a hundred prep schools and maybe three or four of them are as positioned as well as we are because of this timing. You've got people thinking in new ways. And that's just dumb luck, but I'll take it. And it's been wonderful and it's been very good for the college office. And I'm going to let Scott talk about that, how the practicum's been used. But I think the audience needs to know, Trinity Pauli is in a fantastic position to capitalize on what we started five years ago. Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Slade. So, I I was gonna to get to this later, kind of at the end, and, I, and I'll circle back to it, but what Slade's talking about with how well we're positioned with the, with the college office and moving our students on to, to four-year colleges is with COVID happening, almost every university out there, every university and college has now taken ACT and SATs out of their admissions, any admissions read. So, if you look at it from the point of someone who's reading a bunch of college applications, um, whether you're a small liberal arts school in the Northeast or you're, you know, the UC schools uh, out in California, you're missing this, and, I, and I've termed it this point of information on all these students. So every student's going to have a bunch, you know, their two teacher recommendations. Every student's going to have their counselor recommendation, their transcript. Um, and, and that's kind of what, the, what has this student done in, in the typical, you know, 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. school day for four years or, or five years if it's a someone who's a postgraduate or, or repeated. But what they're missing now is these standardized tests. And we've been moving, I shouldn't say we, but uh, colleges have been moving away from this for some time now. Uh, and what we've found is that colleges really like this other story we're telling on the side. They, they love to hear what these students are passionate about. Bill, I, you talked about risks that students are taking, uh, students being creative, students being collaborative. We have this, this the practice for civic leadership is this new story that we're able to weave in with, yes, biology, yes, English, yes, math, but it showcases what these students are interested in and how they're going out on their own and being, you know, not only are they independent, but they're also collaborating with their peers. Uh, and, and I, I know I'm, I'm looking at the uh, attendees and I'll just go through very briefly with each one of the, the three prongs. Uh, so starting with the winter project that Bill talked about. So that's our, anyone in our middle school, our ninth grade, our 10th grade, and then our sen some of our seniors would do a winter project where two teachers of different disciplines would come together. Some of the ones we've had in the past, uh, topics that we've had in the past, I jotted a few down 
Um, a couple of years ago, there was a group that built pizza ovens or a pizza oven on campus. We've done a campus tour in Mandarin. Uh, back, I think my first year at TP, five years ago, I partnered, I teach economics uh, and I partnered with a Spanish teacher and we did the economics of the drug trade. So you saw kind of the social impact um, on Latin American countries, but then also the economic impact on the Latin American countries and then the United States. So you're, you're getting this two pronged approach. Then uh, any juniors, and this is where Bill is talking about for our graduation requirement, any juniors or postgraduates are gonna do the global collaborative challenge. Uh, and this is during the winter when everyone else is working on the, the winter project. And, and I like to term this as we ask a group of five or six students to go out and solve these problems that all the adults in the world can't figure out. So <laughs> we've had everything from uh, this year with a question, are the costs of sending a manned mission to Mars worth it? Please explain that. Um, how do you solve a great Pacific garbage patch? Uh, what do you do about the problem of declining voter turnout in the United States? Uh, this is probably Mr. Mead's favorite because he made it up, but does the UN, does the model of the UN Security Council make sense in today's environment? So there are these incredibly broad, some of them are very uh, United States focused, like I said, the, the voter turnout. Some of them are incredibly broad and the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, that's everyone's issue in the world. So, so it does get a global sense. Um, uh, like I said, it's five or six students teamed up randomly. They have a faculty mentor who will kind of help them through the process. They go through uh, a series of two rough drafts and their end goal is to in 12 minutes and with a visual aid, convince a panel of adults that their solution to this problem is the right one. And, and that to me is like, it's taking healthy risks and getting our kids <coughs> and our students to, to to step out on a limb and try something. And that's part of where um, we've moved from, hey, just do this in six weeks to we're, we're gonna make it the full uh, winter term and we're gonna give you a couple of rough drafts to kind of stumble and, and fall and we'll you know pick yourself up, dust off your knees and, and we'll move on. But um, that's kind of the, the second branch of the practicum. And then the, the third one that we leverage an incredible amount in the in the college office is the senior independent project. So that's for any PGs or seniors. Um, PGs when they come in, they they might as well be seniors because after the first week, they, it feels like they've been here this whole time. Um, but what we ask the kids to do is pick a hobby, a career, or an academic interest. And I like to say, think of something that you you're excited about or think you might have a serious interest in that as a high school student, you just haven't gotten to experience yet. Um, and they spend the fall term of their senior year diving into this. They give a presentation at the end and they're really just tasked with, it's a very broad task, but create a product. So if it's an academic interest, students have gone in a research direction. If it's, um, if it's a career interest, students have gone and interned on, on political Did campaigns. we just lose Scott? Oh. I think I'm here. Am I here? Are you okay. here? Sorry. Um, and uh, and then we've had students who've gone totally outside the career and academic interests, and have uh, we had a student this past year who composed an entire classical music album. So many, many uh, ranges of kind of where you can head with that. But what it allows us to do, circling back to that point of information, it allows us to tell this story in the college office when we're calling up reps and we can not only recalling up reps, but it's also on every student's physical transcript, this journey they've been on, where if you're a four-year student, you get to see exactly what two winter projects you did as a freshman and a sophomore. You'll see what GCC you did, and then we'll see what your senior independent project with along with not only the topic, but you get a, we get 150 character little blurb about it. So we get to paint this incredible picture of what our kids are doing outside of like I said, your regular 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. academic curriculum. And the part where I found it most impactful in talking to college reps is these are the stories that a lot of students have to use their college essay to tell. And we're able to do that for them and give them an, an, another spot to tell another great personal story. So I'll kick it back to you, Slade, if you have anything to add. 
The, the only thing I, I would like to add, what I find fascinating, especially about the Global Collaborative Challenge, is when we do the exit interviews at the end of the process where the kids completely are engrossed with their topic, most of them admit they didn't even know the topic existed before they were given the topic. And it takes them a couple of weeks just to digest and get their arms around what it is they're being asked to look at. And it's fascinating to watch them grow because all of a sudden they're like, oh my gosh, this is a real global issue. Why isn't everybody worried about this? And, you know, and they become advocates on campus for it too. It's, a, it's well, incredible. And they go home and we get calls from the parents like, what have you done to our son? All of a sudden he's like, oh, I'm all over me, over the global, uh, you know, the UN Security Council, you know, enough. So. I love it because we're, we're basically arming our kids with a topic that they can use on their essays, that they can use at the Thanksgiving dinner table, and that they can use in life because they're now thinking about something other than themselves. It's a big issue. The, the other get, thing I, I I'd say is <laughs> talking about thinking about yourself, and Bill, you brought it up earlier, this self-awareness that we're, we're building within our students. The amount of kids who've taken an SIP and it started out as and don't use SIP. Just sorry, senior independent project. And it started out as eh, it's okay. And then they they dive into it and it becomes this thing that defines their Trinity calling career. So I mentioned the student who composed a classical music album. He's this incredible basketball player, comes here with the goal of, you know, I'm gonna play basketball. I'm a great student too. Don't get me wrong, but it was basketball, basketball, uh, basketball for the first year he was here. And then he's, you know, he's always been a great musician. Uh, he played piano in front of the school a few times. So it's not like this is a totally new journey for him, but he starts out with, I'm going to compose one song. Then it's, I'm going to compose this song and I'm going to play it in front of the school for chapel. Then it becomes this, I'm going to compose four, five, six, it becomes, it, it ends up becoming this album and now he's like, I think he's gonna do this for a career. Um, it, and that's the fun piece of it. And, and I'm not saying that every student goes through that transformation, but I, I find it hard to believe that without the senior independent project that we would be having these students do that. And I, you know, I think that that's a, such a great example of, uh, of Sam's independent project because one component of the senior independent project is uh, the opportunity, and it really it's more than an opportunity. I mean, it's it's a requirement if if we if it can be facilitated that the the senior works with a member of the larger community, the larger school community, who has experience in this area of interest and who can mentor and guide the senior in their in their uh, exploration into this journey. Uh, and so for this boy that, that Scott, you've described, as you know, uh, he, we were able to pair him with a graduate of the school who works, this is what he does for a living. He, he helps compose music that, are, that is used in films and television. And, uh, and he, this alum, and I know we have some alumni on the call, but uh, this alum is one of, of many, several alums who have uh, offered to uh, engage with these students in this way. And, and uh, just a shout out that this is, a, this is a fabulous way for alumni to be connected and in some cases reconnected with the school by, by building a relationship with a, with a student. Uh, and that, that builds a connection between the past and the future. And so the alumni helping to mentor the, the, the soon to be graduate into this new world, uh, equipped with some real uh, important skills in an area that, that that soon to be graduate has a personal interest in. The other thing, Bill, that I think is worth pointing out, and, and Roberta, you're a piece of the puzzle here. It, it's, a, it's wonderful, I think, to see the senior independent projects affect not just the top kids in the class, but even some of the kids who, you know, find school very, very challenging, mm -hmm. but they can fall in love with the, with the SIP, with the Senior Independent Project. 
And oftentimes, you know, Roberta, whether it's you or anyone in your group, you know, you guys get involved and help the person launch this passion. And, and you know, one might think, oh, this is great for your top students. Yeah, it is great for the top students. But it's also great for the students that have only struggled in school because they get to do something that's theirs and that means something to them. And I think that goes back to, um, you know, what Scott was talking about with self-awareness um, and being able to scaffold that and giving them their voice. You know, um, at the end, these are their stories, as Scott said, you know, the, the seniors, but sometimes it takes a lot of scaffolding and it takes um, a lot of skills and stuff like that and a lot of modeling. And that's what I think we do really well. So it starts even before the GCC and the Senior Independent Project. You know, it starts early on. It starts with the first relationship when they walk in and they meet somebody and, and, and they start to exhale a little bit. And you can almost watch it. It's like a washing and it's just physical for them. And then when they get to these things, you guys get to see them on the end usually, or if they come in and they've already, you know, the maturity, they have some maturity and they have some life skills usually developed by them. Um, watching it from the very get-go, especially if you have an eighth grader or a ninth grader and watching that evolution just makes me cry almost all, every day, you know, because it's just amazing when they start to find their voice and then they find their story, um, you know, and I think we do that collaboratively. And um, I have to say the faculty, especially this year, um, they are the learners. Uh, I'm watching it day by day throughout the summer and they are coming up with the, the ways that we're gonna be able to support these kids and get them to those really creative stories, so. You know what's fun too is watching how the kids are using this information, whether it's the global collaborative challenge topic that they, they took on or whether it's their senior independent project or even drawing on an old winter project in the interviews, when they sit down with the college counselors, the, I, I remember, um, I, I believe it was Hobart was interviewing on campus, Scott, and the Hobart rep comes out looking like she just boxed with Mike Tyson because she's like, your kids are, I mean, they're doing all these things. This is not your typical high school. What, you know, what are you feeding these guys? <laughs> And it's wonderful because we're giving them the cannon fodder to go in there and, and knock these interviews dead. Because one of the big things we always hear from kids is, what do I say in an interview? Talk about the global problem of uh, the UN Security Council. Just get it going. Get the, you know it better than they do. And, and they do it. And then we get the colleges like, where are you finding these kids? So it, it's been such a win-win. It's just, it's fantastic. And it's going to help us with this COVID year. I am convinced, mm -hmm. as Scott said, it gives us that other data point because we can't use SATs and ACTs. It's going to give us another piece to the admissions puzzle that 99.9% .9 of the applications from other schools they don't have. And I think, I think that all, a lot of that, I think ties into the all boys component, right? We talk about the relationships that have been built. We talk about our boys, our young men being able to latch onto something potentially maybe a little bit quicker than they might have maybe in a co-ed environment. And so Bill, if you could just talk about that all boys component you know, the Trinity Pauling impact and its ability to prepare the boys for an ever-changing world and, and how that, how you feel like, you know, especially now being back for six years after been in a co-ed school for so long, what, where, where do you think that um, impact is happening the most? Yeah, you know, it's really, it's really, it's fascinating for me because uh, I was ahead of a, a day school for co-ed day school for 14 years a co-ed day school that had a curriculum that, not surprisingly, sort of looks like where the Trinity Pauling curriculum is, is going. Um, and so it was very, uh, you know, forward thinking, preparing those students for an ever-changing world, although the school's mission was, was not phrased that way. And, uh, and yeah, though, I mean, those skills are important for boys and girls, of course. 
And you know, you can teach creativity, creativity uh, in co-ed way, co-ed environments that that is not going to be different single sex to co-ed. You can teach collaboration skills in in both environments, and and they're going to look very very similar. Uh, but I'll tell you where they look different. When you start throwing in the elements of self-awareness and you add the risk-taking, which comes with vulnerability, mm -hmm. that's where they look different. Because, the, you know, my experience that the boys in, a, in an all-boys environment are more open to that vulnerability than it was my experience to see many boys, not all boys, but many boys in a co-ed environment. Uh, and that openness to vulnerability, I think, comes from the fact of the relationships that you mentioned, JP, the relationship that the boys have with one another. But, it, and those, that relationship, the depth of the, their, um, you know, their sense of brotherhood, uh, you know, diminishes a, a, a potential, let's call it a, a social penalty for any, you know, for, for a misstep or a failure or an embarrassment if they try something and it doesn't work out. And I can tell you from being in a co-ed environment, there is that fear. Mm -hmm. There is that, that element that, that puts a barrier up you know, for both boys and girls, but girls in, in high school are more mature than boys. And, uh, and so the boys, you know, they, they'll hit that barrier and sometimes step back in a way that I've not seen boys do that here, that they, they will take that risk and they will, you know, get a deeper sense of this self-awareness because they can take those risks. And Roberta, you know, I, you know, you know, I, I know you've seen that certainly because the boys, in, in the Center for Learning Achievement are really, you know, be, you know, learning how to be comfortable with vulnerability. Absolutely, and it's so funny because I don't think it was that many years ago, I was talking to um, a colleague um, at another institution and they got really uncomfortable with that word because I like the word vulnerability because once you get to vulnerability, then they can acknowledge where their, their weaknesses are and they can and recognize their strengths. But, you know, I think with single sex, we get them there faster. That's the thing is, uh, you know, they are apprehensive and there's all kinds of research that shows how quickly someone shuts down when they have a misstep or an incident where, you know, especially when there are girls around, um, they don't recover. Uh, it's noticed a little, um, it shines a little brighter and, and, and it shuts them down. So I find that um, the single sex, we can have really con candid conversations, things that they haven't, haven't really gotten used to. And, and I see this with, with um, the advisor, advisee um, relationship all the time. These are wonderful conversations that these kids are having that they're not, you know, they, they haven't had with another adult outside their family. Um, so uh, the, the, the single sex is a major component in us getting to where we need to get to, um, especially in the Center for Learning Achievement. And at the same time, recognizing that this ever-changing world is a co-ed world. And, mm -hmm. and we, need to, we need to prepare these boys in a single sex environment to be engaged participants in a co-ed world. And, and, you know, that's a topic for a different discussion, but we have lots of different opportunities where that, where that happens, including within this practicum and projects, doing projects with, with girls from other schools and, uh, and, and, and girls from, from local public schools, if it involves the arts and things like that. And, I, you know, Bill, it's, it's, we've, we've talked about the Center for Learning Achievement, which is, has evolved over 50 years uh, we've talked about the practicum uh, for civic leadership, which really hit the ground running. Well, it seems like it hits the ground running every year because it's just, we, you all, not me, you all make it better and better every year. Um, so what is, what's, what's next in that uh, mind of yours? What, what's going to be the next evolution of our program, um, again, to, pre to prepare these boys 
for this ever-changing world? Uh, you know, I, I think it's, you know, it, it's, it's an evolution. And, and uh, you know, I, I began speaking at the outset of this program about, um, about competency-based education. And I think that's a thread that connects the Center for Learning Achievement with the practicum, mm -hmm. this element of self-awareness. Uh, but if you think about an ever-changing world, it's, you know, it is increasingly experiential and, and adding uh, a real focus on experiential education, which is not new, it's, it's experiential aspect connects also the, the Center for Learning Achievement and the practicum. Uh, but I think there are areas that we can, that we can dig a little deeper in that experiential uh, learning and education, things that we're doing already, but we can, we can, you know, develop even more well-pronounced avenues around how we're teaching leadership skills and how, you know, how that is being applied in an experiential way. Uh, how are we getting the students to be engaged with the environment and, and, uh, and also applying that leadership to environmental stewardship? In terms of creativity, how, you know, how can we uh, build opportunities to sharpen our students' entrepreneurial skills, where they can, they, you know, they, they can begin to create things that, that, have, that will have value, you know, not just monetary value, perhaps, but, but social value. Uh, and um, and how, do we, how do we really teach what true citizenship is? That, uh, that citizenship is, is not just about uh, your civic, your civil rights or, or your, the, pro the process of engaging in a democracy, but, but it's about how do, you know, how do you build the common good and how do you, how do you create interrelated communities that are, that are moving forward uh, that, that with respect, with dialogue, with, with uh, civility. And I think that those are areas that we can really uh, dig a little bit deeper in, uh, in an experiential way that will even further advance our ability to prepare the boys, our students for an ever-changing world. Can, can, can I piggyback on something you just said, Bill? Sure. Uh, and this is really to your question, JP, of what you know, what's going on in Bill's mind, and what's the next step. Uh, we're we, the college office with Bill's participation. We are starting a new program, and we're going to roll it out this fall. And it's going to be very small the first year because it's it, it's still in its infancy. But because we're being recognized by colleges for our practicum we are able now to partner with some colleges where we can say, look, we've got a kid who's just done a great job on entrepreneurial programs through the practicum. And we've found college, so in this case, it's Marist has agreed, oh, okay, if you have that student who's shown his, his uh, passion for entrepreneurship, we want that student and we will accept that student on an early action basis, no questions asked. It, it's a very different, it, this is a paradigm change with the college process. Uh, we've reached out to a couple schools and Swanee has said, hey, if you've got somebody from the practicum who has just been fantastic on environmental issues, we'll take them on an early action basis, no questions asked. This is new, and, and, and I think we're going to go slow this year, but this will just get bigger and bigger because colleges want our kids. They want our kids. It's fantastic. So I, I share that. Um, I don't want to get too far out over the tips of my skis on this, but we've got two schools that have signed up, and we're hoping to hear from a couple more. So by the time we hit the fall, we'll have these relationships in place. And that's exciting stuff. That, that's just, that's new.
And I gotta give credit, that is Scott Harp's idea. So kudos to you, Scott. I couldn't do it without you. <laughs> oh, we're getting into, it's getting to be You're eight so o'clock. <laughs> we're getting mush. We're getting mushy here. Um, <laughs> but uh, you know, Bill, before before we sign off, and and uh, you know, I, I I talk about the weeks to come. You know, do you have you know, sort of as we've talked about, we have uh, we have current parents on this phone call. We have prospective parents on this call. We have a a. a young men in the application pool that are on this call, as well as, um, and I can't emphasize this uh, more, some great alums that are on this call. But what would you, as we are pivoting from summer to school, you know, what are some, I don't know, lessons that maybe, you know, if these parents on this call have younger kids that are not at Trinity Pauling or daughters or, or whatever, what are some, you know, takeaways from tonight and, and maybe even moving onward that, that you could potentially give to, to these families? Um, you know, I think it, uh, you know, it's never, it's, ne it's never too soon to sort of help build the self-awareness process. And, you know, it starts with dialogue. And, it, you know, it, 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 one thing that, that I know I, I, we're all going to miss this year uh, is the absence of family-style meals at Trinity Paul. Uh, because that, you know, that was a daily opportunity to sit with a bunch of students and really get to know them. Uh, but you know now that families are spending more time together, uh, sharing meals together, what a great opportunity to to you know sort of fast track you know this journey of self awareness through dialogue, because I think that is something that that really was was in danger of slipping away. And, and if you looked at studies, how many families were spending time eating together, it had really dwindled down. And, uh, and so now there's an opportunity with everybody being together to, you know, to have those discussions because they lead to wonderful discoveries about your kids. Uh, and it, it leads to discoveries for them about their own self-awareness. That's great. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, so, for all of you uh, who have joined tonight, thank you so much for being here. Uh, so that you know, we, we've done, uh, you know, since April 29th, uh, we've uh, had seven, this is our eighth, uh, excuse me, we've had more than that. We're about on number 10 of these webinars and they're all on our website. Um, all the video uh, is, is available if you wanna go back and, and listen to some topics that were spoken of early in the spring uh, and as I said, next week, uh, we will be doing a, a webinar on fostering an ethos of effort, which again, a lot of what we talked about tonight will probably be spoken about uh, next week, but in, in a different way, because uh, unfortunately, our alums that we're bringing on uh, were not a part of the practicum, um, but they definitely uh, had this relationship, self-awareness, um, and everything that we've talked about. So we hope that you... Uh, will join us next week. The, the Zoom registration is right on our website, and I'm sure you'll get an invitation moving forward. Um, but as always, we, we wish you a, a great summer uh, as we move on towards the start of school, and uh, we hope that you stay safe and stay healthy and enjoy, uh, your, enjoy your time with your family. So from all of us at Trinity Pauling, thank you so much, and we look forward to seeing you soon.